Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Broker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Joe Lalo. And for today's show, we're going to do a craft focus and share some of our tips for making protagonists that readers care about and will follow anywhere. And then we'll answer some of your questions on the subject. And there were actually some really great questions in the Facebook group. So thank you guys for asking that. We will get to those uh, in the second half. Uh, we're going to start with uh, sharing some news of our own and also the world of self-publishing, Amazon series page, teaser. But uh, Andrea, why don't you go ahead? Okay. And um, I am so excited. Oh my gosh, guys. Uh, for the first time since probably December, I got the writing bug and it was like really, really bad. Like Saturday, I was like, oh, I'm going to write. And it's been, I, I don't know, my burnout like it just lasted for such a long time. This is the longest it's ever gone before. And, and part of the problem was I was pushing and writing and pushing during the time when I was burned out. And I don't know, I started my YouTube channel when my burnout started, which was in December. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, but it's also kind of frustrating. So I'm like really, really excited. I'm able to write again, but it's also frustrating because this week's been the worst week to start writing. My brother and his wife had an emergency and I ended up tending their two small boys all day on Tuesday. So one of them is seven months older than my toddler and one is seven months younger than my toddler. And it, it was really, really rough. Um, then my toddler got sick. Nolan's car broke down. My phone died and I had to do a factory reset. Um, but even still with all that going on, I was still able to get in a bunch of editing on Sable Heart. Nine pages in two days, guys. <laughs> so, so much victory. <laughs> um, but so the plan is to tie off the series with this and, the, and one more book and then to move on to other projects. Um, but since, I mean, since I'm in such a fragile, I'm so fragile emotionally, just my state of mind. Um, but seriously, I am, I'm in a fragile position just mainly because of the point of life I'm in my season of life. So I'm being really, really careful not to overdo it. My free time is really, really sparse. Like I have like an hour a day and it's interspersed throughout here and there. Um, and so I'm taking a break from my YouTube channel, which kind of is ironic because I just started making money on it. <laughs> so, and I'm on hiatus. I, I know a bunch of our listeners are actually on my newsletter, which is hi guys <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, I'm on hiatus for my newsletter. Um, and that's, uh, on, speaking of my newsletter, uh, I'm going to be making big changes there. I'm still not sure what they're going to be. Um, I know I want to less, I want to email less frequently and I know for sure I'll be switching up the content. I'm getting bored. I'm just so bored. I'm, I don't know. I'm in it le leads to burnout and it's just something I've been, I dread, you know, my weekly emails and I just, I want it to be something that I enjoy, you know, and not something that, that I hate and dread every single week. Um, anyway, so uh, even if I, what I decide to do, I don't know. I don't know if, if it doesn't end up serving my business needs. Part of the thing is I'm, I'm restarting. I want to change how I'm running my newsletter. I'm going to, um, I'm just going to tweak things. I'm going to stop emailing for several months and then I will start up my new schedule, start up my new, my new content, everything, and then do it regularly from there. And I'm thinking I'll probably email just once a month, maybe once every other week, probably once a month, honestly, because I can't release as frequently as I have in the past. And I don't want to be emailing when I'm only releasing a book every two months, every two months, <laughs> book, two books a year. Um, anyway. And then, um, and then something that's been on my mind a lot is a quote by this, uh, by Robert D. Hales. He said, when you cannot do what you've always done, then you only do what matters most. And I always thought my newsletter mattered most, but it's not converting the way it used to. And I'm feeling bored, restless, and resentful toward it. So it changes in order. I'll keep everyone posted. Um, what matters most right now is honestly writing. Like I, I finally am excited about my characters and stories again. And, and I'm like, I, I'm actually in a, position where I can actually get in some solid writing because we're finally getting homeschool down to a good schedule. And anyway, so, yep, that's pretty much it for me this uh, week. I'm glad to hear that your, uh, that your writing spark has come back. It's one of those things where it's like, even if you're able to make yourself write during a time when you don't feel like writing, there's always the fear that what you're writing is going to feel like you didn't feel like writing. So I'm glad that you got some, you got some pep in that. Uh, I have cons comparatively less to talk about. It's NaNoWriMo, and I'm doing NaNoWriMo. Uh, because the NaNoWriMo quota, which is 1,667 words a day in order to get 50,000 in a month, uh, is way less than my usual quota. I'm trying to triple it, which is 5,000 words a day. 
which is still below some people's averages, but way above my usual average. Uh, and so far I've been doing it, um, assuming that I write at least 700 more words today. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I plan to. I anticipate losing steam toward the end of the, the, the month, not just because I will have completely exhausted myself trying to do 5K a day consistently, but because the further into a story, the more complex it gets and the more likely I am to discover that my outline was not perfect. Um, I also will be sending out an email soon reminding people of my most recent release, uh, which is Nova Igniter, Big Sigma 6. I was going to send it out because I released my book on a Tuesday and I usually send out the reminder a certain, you know, a week or two after the book was released, but it seemed like releasing it on November 3rd was a bad idea for a newsletter. I don't think a lot of people would have read it. So I'm probably going to wait until, you know, things cool down a little bit and, and we're all a little bit less confused about what's happening, which as a, as a bonus means that the uh, price drop I did for the rest of the series is going to continue at least until a week after whenever that newsletter is, which is fine. It's still giving me a little bit of a bump in my, in my sales. So yeah, that's about it. I'm wrapping up the promo for the last release and writing a book that I probably won't be able to sell because it's, it's, some books go off the rails. This book starts off perpendicular to the rails. So this is this is just for fun. I think the patrons are going to get it. Yeah, we're actually recording this two days after the election. You guys will get this a week, I think. But, you know, this is the first election where you didn't actually know who won by, by later in the week, for sure. So that's always fun times. Um, so I have a I did want to comment, Joe, 150,000 words in a month is a ton. Like when I'm, when I get really rolling and write 10K in a day, uh, I usually do that for a few days. And same as you, probably the beginning is easier. And then it just, I don't know, for some reason, I really, I know people, other people speed up at the end, but I get to the climactic stuff and I'm just like, I catch myself, can I skip to the epilogue and just write some banter? So um, that's a lot of words. I don't usually, I probably don't do that because I, I write hard until I finish and then I collapse <laughs> for a day or two and edit. And Andrea, I'm curious, This you've shared before, I think your YouTube channel is on gaming. Did you get the thousand subscribers and you're just running YouTube ads? No, not not YouTube ads. Um, I'm. It's on gaming, yes. And my money's coming from views and it's actually a pretty decent chunk of money. I just, I live stream like right now, like, like once a week. And I've got a couple of viewers who donate every single time I live stream. One of them's donated almost $200 now. And so I'm like, his last, his last donation was come back to the game. That's what he said with his donation. I was like, I, I got to take a break guys. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cool. Maybe you, if you, uh, you can come back to that after you get your stable heart done or whatever. <laughs> All right. So for myself, oh, I, I did want to comment too uh, on your getting bored thing. So I feel like I think all three of us probably feel some of that because you get to like 10 years in and you're like midway through a career. And for most of us, this is a second career. So I like I feel like when I did the pen name, I like started a new pen name and all anonymous. I'm like, I'm going to write rapid release three new novels and then write six with this pen name and make it work and do all the things and start from scratch. And I was like super into it. Now I'm like, the idea that I'm like, oh my God, that's way too much work. No way do I want to start another pen name or even try to keep two running. And I feel like I've gone more minimalist too on, I'm sort of like now at this point, I know what moves the dial and I know it's not worth bothering with and what I will resent having said yes to. So I am getting better. Um, but yeah, I feel like after a while, it's just not, not everything's not new and fun anymore. So you do get to that point. I, I feel like everybody probably does. All right, for my news, uh, actually this is Amazon's news. I wanted, you guys if, might already know since we're a week late <laughs> in reporting it, but uh, Amazon KDP last weekend added the series manager to the dashboard, which if you've been one of those people who, I don't know, for me it's always been hit and miss this last year or two since they brought out the series pages. Sometimes they would just automatically add a new book and sometimes it's like three months later, I'm like, hey, <laughs> did you wanna go ahead and put this one on my series page? and Usually emailing would get it done, but I think Andrew was telling us before we, we started recording that uh, not necessarily. So I've uh, tested it with my Death Before Dragon series. I have the book seven prequel, or not prequel, uh, book seven is on pre-order uh, coming out in a couple weeks. And in the past, I've had a hard time getting them to add pre-orders to the series page. So I was like, well, let's try it and see if it works. 
and it did. It went right up. Book seven is now listed on the series page, even though it's a, a pre-order. So that's good. Uh, they allow you to put in prequels and like extra stuff, short stories related or even box sets. But as of right now, that stuff will not appear on the series page. I'm hoping the fact that they allow you to do it means that they are eventually going to have like something underneath that's like, oh, and these are also related to the series because I know I would like to have my box sets on there and I have like three series that somehow ended up with like a 5.5 novel or novella. I, I don't recommend you do that, guys. And I should know better by now, but the last the sci-fi series has one of those. It's, it's just, there it is. Uh, as far as my own writing news, uh, so this year I kind of wrapped up the sci-fi series last month and I'm writing a couple more books in the urban fantasy series, thinking towards the next series in 2021. But I do find that after about eight months, the uh, sale or no, well, sales are down because I advertise, you know, I have to admit to, I've kind of been ignoring the ads for like three months. They, they still sell, I still get the receipts, you know, but it, it's not doing as well as it was earlier on. And I've kind of found that even with the ads I do on books that convert pretty well and get pretty good engagement that after six months, you just, it's like everybody's seen it <laughs> and they've either decided they're going to buy it or not. At least it feels that way. I'm sure that's not true. But uh, I find that after a while, it's not a bad idea to just turn off the ad and maybe advertise something else. Or in this case, I asked the designer to put together the books one through three box set. And I'm going to wait till it's been a full year before discounting those, but that'll be the next thing to try to, uh, about that time I should be completing that series. So that'd be a good time to run a discount on the first three in the box set. And I'm positive that books one through three won't be as big of a money maker as when I did like the, the complete series with a trilogy or a books one through five complete series. Um, but I'm hoping it will be worth spending the KDP ads on. And I may try Facebook ads. Again, I haven't even been in there since maybe June for Facebook ads. So that's the plan. And the sci-fi one actually has a book, books one through three already because they, the audiobook publisher put them out as the first three. But I've never dropped that one from $9.99 because I didn't want to, again, I like to wait at least a year before I drop, like basically put the first three books on sale. So I'm going to give that one a shot too. That's one where the first book, the blurb is, is not great as far as being written to market or anywhere near really space opera sounding, but it is the story that it is. I think the box set actually has a better blurb as far as appealing to that market. You know, the, the space ragtag spaceship crew against the world kind of thing. And I was able to do that summing up the first three books, but I couldn't have really done that for the first one book. So I'm crossing my fingers that that will uh, convert decently for ads because I actually never had a whole lot of luck with that series uh, with advertising that book one. And like I said, I think it's like the cover is great space opera, but you read the blurb and you're like, oh, this is a guy being chased by robots. <laughs> this is not quite your typical space opera. Um, so, but actually the series did quite well, all things considered. And, you know, I had a huge number of reviews and a lot of really happy fans when I published the eighth and final one. So, uh, I do consider it a success, but I, I, some things are easier to advertise and convert better than others, I've certainly found. All right, now that I've rambled for 10 minutes, Andrea's over there playing with spoons or something <laughs> to keep awake. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about our topic. Hmm, I gave myself more talking to do here. Okay, so our topic that we're going to start with, like I said, we're going to answer your questions in a little bit, but we're going to start off just kind of giving some tips for writing protagonists that readers root for. I think we've all written numerous series at this point, and you can kind of look back in which ones got the most fan mail, which ones sold really well, and kind of see what were the common denominators in those stories. Uh, before we jump into the tips, just a quick definition. There are many out there for protagonist. Uh, some just say the leading or main character, but one I still remember from 10th grade English <laughs> that kind of stuck in my head was that the, the protagonist is the person who drives the action and changes or causes others to change over the course of the story. So why worry about a likable protagonist or one that the readers root for? I guess we're doing this before we actually jump into our tips. <laughs> why should you care? You know, not, not everybody will love your protagonist no matter what you do, but if your target audience doesn't identify with your hero, you have a problem. Uh, we'll talk about this a few times when we're answering our questions. It, you know, yes, some people will kind of hate read books. Like 
the plot will be gripping enough to pull them along or they almost <laughs> like hating the main character. But I think you get a lot of people that will just, if they don't connect and care about the character early on, they're just gonna put the book down. Uh, some readers, you know, are definitely more into characters than plot. And you've probably heard it a lot that people were like, that's my favorite character. I'll read anything that author puts out, even if the character's just reading a phone book, uh, because they just love the personality so much. And it's, it's really powerful to have something like that. Because um, if you're writing a series and your income, you know, your plans for your income that you think you're going to get relies on you selling, you know, X books in the series. If your readers don't care about the hero, the odds are going to really drop dramatically of them finishing the book and continuing on to the rest of the series. And, you know, if you plan to have a 10 book story arc or five book story arc and the read through really drops off after the first one, that's kind of tough. Um, but if the characters, you know, if people really like them, even if the plot didn't super grab them or they're like, oh, I've seen that a dozen times before, uh, they will often keep reading anyway if they like the characters. All right, I'll pass it to Joe and Andrea to add some uh, why we worry about a likable protagonist or one that the readers will root for. Um, all right, so like by definition, the protagonist is who most of the events in the story will be happening to. Uh, if you want your story to have any sort of emotional resonance or if you want there to be any excitement or anxiety or drama or pathos, you need people to care about the protagonist. If, if they don't care what's happening to the protagonist, they won't care literally about anything else in your book because most of what's in your book is happening to your protagonist. So the rest of the story structurally won't work without a protagonist, uh, with a, a protagonist that's too bland or just actively unpleasant. And also uh, your protagonist is generally, and this sort of carries on for something that Lindsay said, but your, your, your protagonist is generally the viewpoint or the focus of the story. Uh, the readers are experiencing the, they are probably experiencing the story through the protagonist. And that requires your reader to sort of step into the role of the protagonist. And in a very subtle way, that means that your protagonist represents your reader. And uh, if your protagonist is not a particularly pleasant person, there's a subtle indication that you're, you're basically saying to either, you know, certainly not purposely, but in a very real way, you're sort of giving an opinion of your audience when you create your character because you've created a character you think they'll identify with. And uh, if that person is detestable, then they're probably not going to be terribly pleased at the opinion you have of them. So generally speaking, your, your, your character uh, represents your, your, your readers and therefore should reflect them positively. It's a really interesting point, actually. And Lindsay, you're right. They are spoons <laughs> from the dollar store. I bought like this little teacup set for my baby hermit crabs to play in. I put the cups in the crab tank and kept the spoons out. I meant to give them my daughter, but they make really good toys for listening and paying attention. <laughs> um, anyway, no, that is that really is a good point. Um, I didn't have I never even thought of that before that that you are projecting. Basically, you're writing what you think people will like. And a lot of that time for like inexperienced authors, especially you're writing what people you think people will like based on what you like. And so that's something that I fell as into a trap with. And that's something that you just have to kind of figure out as you go through your writing. Um, so the question was why worry about a likable protagonist or one that readers root for? Um, so I have three, three little points here. Um, so why worry? Um, because we're writing books to entertain. No one wants to read something that annoys, frustrates or bores them. Um, protagonists that aren't moving or that aren't likable or humorous in some way don't entertain readers. Um, and then next, because we are writing books to transport, uh, we want to explore the, sorry, we read to explore the universe to experience things through someone else's eyes. What's the point of doing that if the person we're going along with doesn't have natural reactions or doesn't view things in a relatable or even unexpected or fun way? Um, and then last, um, because we are writing books to educate. So even if the experience we're sharing isn't ours, there's still going to be an aspect of truth in it. Um, how the character responds, what they decide to do with what they've learned, experienced, et cetera, can and does sway readers. So readers react to things that they read in books and even fiction can be educational. So that's, that's and it doesn't have to be like, like formal, dry, academic, educational. I mean, people, I've learned so much from reading fiction books, like, you know, where the red ferns grow rather red, red fern, whatever. I learned that I can cry when a dog dies because I'd never had a pet dog. I got attacked and bit by dogs when I was a kid. And it took me years to get over a fear of dogs. 
And when I read that book, I, it just, it hit me so hard. And of course it hits everybody, makes everybody cry, but I'd never experienced that sort of feeling where a dog was concerned. And so that was an educational experience for me. Um, anyway, so that's, that's, those are my thoughts and I'm going to hand the thingy hand the mic back to Lindsay. I cannot talk today guys. Okay. I'm done. All right. So the problem with that story was that the second dog died. Spoilers, guys, for who those who didn't uh, read that 50 years ago, 30 years ago. I don't know. It was old when I read it as a kid. Um, but no, that story wrecks everybody because you're like, why? Why does the other one die? <laughs> All right. Now Andrew's going to have me tearing up here. Okay. So we're going to go on to our tips. And you know, these are not, you don't have to do these guys. These are just kind of like, what has worked for us. And like I said, I think at this point we've written enough series and published enough books and different protagonists to kind of get a gauge for which ones really people connect with and which ones were like, ah, they were okay. But you know, honestly, the side characters were what I was reading for and you're like, oh, okay, good to know. Um, so my first one, and I feel like most beginning writers, uh, and not to say that advanced writers can't do this too, it's just a stylistic choice, but I, I feel like in the beginning, most writers start with the plot first. Uh, they just like, I have all these ideas and I want this to happen. And especially in epic fantasy or like saga kind of stuff, you know, historical fiction, you may be like, I, it has to be a plot because these are the, you know, this is what happened in that historical time period. So it has to revolve around this. And then they create the characters and slot them into the plot as they are needed to move the plot forward and have the story happen that the author wants to happen. And I've done this too. Uh, and like I said, a lot of people, this is the way they do it and that's what they like. But I find as a reader and, you know, when I've done critiquing for other authors, I can tell, <laughs> I can pick these stories out versus the ones where the character was first. And then the events that happened were a result of the character's motivations and desires, and they could not have happened to any other character. So when you do the plot first, and this won't happen to everybody, there's lots of great stories that you can tell it's plot first, but um, you do kind of run the risk of either maybe cardboard characters who just kind of exist to further the plot or actions that feel un inauthentic to the reader. Um, if you do a lot of critiquing, you see this all the time. It's just like, why is the character doing this? This makes no sense for them to do this based on who you've created. Like, why are they doing this? And the answer is because the author needs the plot to move forward. So this character is gonna do this thing that you're, as a reader, you're like, that's stupid. Why would they do that? Um, so just if you do do plot first, just be really aware of making sure that the things your characters are doing make sense. Like they have a reason to go in that basement where they just heard a scream and a monster is <laughs> running around in the neighborhood killing people. All right, next tip is to, you know, make your protagonist awesome in some way that your target audience wishes they could be awesome. Even if it's just that your hero is sarcastic and they get to say all the things to their boss that you wish you could say to your boss, but there's no way you could do that because you'd be fired or socially ostracized. But um, we love a character that they don't, they don't have to worry about that stuff. Or, you know, maybe things happen, but um, they do it anyway. So, uh, you know, or at a lot of times, like in sci-fi and fantasy, even in thriller, you know, contemporary romance, everything, uh, somebody, they're just badass at something, you know, they got some really cool uh, thing that they get to do that we get to live vicariously through them. And, you know, you don't have to do this. There are plenty of examples of the everyday man character, the hobbits, you know, but I certainly find as a reader that it's much easier to root for someone that they are both awesome in some way, or they grow to be awesome in the series, but they also have fears, you know, flaws, as, as we call it in the biz. Uh, and, you know, and it's just, that makes the, it's the flaws and stuff that make them human and make them feel like they're not too good. Cause that is one of the challenges when you create like a superhero kind of character. Uh, they always have to have their kryptonite, right? Or they have to have issues and fears that they're kind of working through, um, you know, cause it's, that's what we love is the person that is, you know, they're never, they're afraid to do the right thing, but they're going to do it anyway, versus the person that's just like not afraid of anything, uh, you know, like, oh, they're so brave and courageous, but actually, it's the people who are afraid and do the courageous thing anyway. And we really identify with that because we all wish we could be like that. All right, next tip. 
whatever flaws you give them or superpowers, uh, you know, I think it's important to make sure the plot allows these things to come into play. Otherwise, they're really not very memorable and they may not even be believable. I don't know how many romance novels I've read where the heroine is supposed to be a genius with like multiple PhDs by age 24. Guys, I don't know many people that have multiple PhDs by age 24, but um, then they never do anything smart in the book or they never like get to use their education in any way in the book. So it's like, it was just this, you were filling out a character sheet and you're like, yes, yeah, she speaks five different languages and uh, you know has an advanced database programming degree. <laughs> so. Uh, obviously, if you're writing a series, you're not necessarily going to have them do the thing related to their career or their sk special skills in every book, but your reader is going to feel like, you know, it's kind of like Chekhov's gun, right? That you put the gun on the above the mantle in Act 1, and then it gets used in Act 3, and you're just like, yeah, I saw that gun. I knew it was going to be used, and then you feel like it gives this, I don't know, endorphin rush, I guess, and it's just very satisfying for those things to come into play, so... If you make your heroine a philologist, you better give her some dead languages that need deciphering to save the day. Or if your hero has seizures, you should have him have a seizure during the climactic end battle. And those are very specific examples from characters that I have written. So uh, that's my last step, you know, or no, I have one more. I lied. I have two more. You guys, I have so many bullet points. <laughs> but as far as, you know, there's so many characters out there that are just really bland. You, you know, you download these samples and you're like, I just don't feel anything for these uh, characters. They don't really quite feel like real people. And, you know, your mileage may vary, but I find that the more of my own quirks and issues or like the quirks and issues of my friends that I have, that we have, that I put into the heroes, the more memorable and popular they are with the readers. Um, on the other side, because I've done both, I've kind of had like plain Jane characters that may, you know, maybe they have like, they're healers, so they have that power going for them, but um, I typically, those more plain Jane types will end up being, like I said earlier, shown up by the more interesting side characters, which, uh, you know, so if you can add just a couple, you know, I'll call, like I said, I'll call them quirks or just memorable things that they're dealing with that an average human might deal with, it, it makes them more relatable and more interesting, quite frankly. Um, so some of my last one, and I, I, this is one of my answers to one of the questions later too, but I, some of my most popular heroes, protagonists, have been modeled loosely off real people or actors playing a role. And they, that really helps me keep them in my mind, like picture them as somebody who's horrible at picturing faces and things. And it's just by the time, you know, you bring them into your fantasy world or you then add some of your quirks or flaws or the kryptonite, whatever it's going to be, they change enough that it's not obvious to the reader. Like, oh, obviously that is Colonel O'Neill from Stargate SG-1, you know, it's like, no, no, this is my character now. Nobody else would know that until I blab it on the podcast. All right. I will let Joe and Andrea give their tips now before we go into listener questions later. All right. Um... So uh, I definitely agree on most of those points, all those points. Uh, and when we're talking about the skills that you give a hero, uh, I like to, to sort of make sure that the skills that the hero has are useful to the plot, but they're not perfect to the plot. Like naturally they're the keystone of the whole story and they're gonna have to save the universe. But if the universe was contrived to be rescuable only by them, then it can feel a little thin. Uh, there should come at least one point and ideally several points in a story where your hero is holding a hammer and surrounded by screws and they have to solve a problem with skills they didn't have or adapt their skills to the current situation. Uh, that is growth and change and that is what sort of makes a character interesting in the long run and sort of keeps you with them as you know keeps you rooting, especially if they fail the first two or three times they run into that situation and then succeed eventually. Um, also, don't just focus exclusively on your hero correcting their flaws. First of all, if you're writing a series, crossing off flaws like a checklist in each book is going to cause problems as you get further into the series because you're going to run out of flaws or you'll, 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 you'll either have a perfect character or someone who spontaneously develops new flaws, which if done poorly can be really glaring. Um, the flaw should, should be a consistent struggle, a constant struggle and uh, maybe even turn things on their head sometimes, like maybe you have your hero turn their liability into an asset, or maybe even that's a problem because they end up embracing their flaws too much and being afraid to grow beyond them because they think they need them to succeed. So the flaws should be a constant 
presence and maybe should never be completely wiped away. Um, also, this is a subtle one. Uh, I like little things like this. Try giving your heroes some mannerisms that coincide with internal actions, like a, a small external action that coincides with a large internal action. There's an episode of West Wing where they establish that you can always tell when President Bartlett has made a decision, he's made his mind up on something because he puts his hands into his pockets and he smiles to the side. And then later on in that, and I think it might even be in the following episode, he's asked a question that has been the focus of a multi-episode arc and they don't show him answer. They just show him put his hands in his pockets and smile aside. And you know that he's made up his mind. And that's, a, I, I really like when you can attach, like basically create a shorthand. It's like, you know, an inside joke with the, uh, with the reader. I do it in my books all the time. My sci-fi hero, the hero of the book that I was talking about earlier, uh, he's a, a, a driver, a racer. And whenever he's about to do something really unadvisable with a, with a vehicle, he always puts a stick of chewing gum in his mouth. And so you know something's about to happen when he pulls out the chewing gum. And I just feel like that, that kind of like that little small thing that is very unique to the character and your, your readers know about once they start to learn about your character provides a connection that, uh, that can be really rewarding later on. So as another, another example of your last, your subtle thing, I mean, I've been watching House, the TV show while doing dishes. <laughs> uh, when, he solves, uh, when he solves the case, he stares off into the distance with this, oh yeah, expression on his face. So you always know he solved the case when that happens. Um, so Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Uh, that's a really, really good book on writing screenplays. Um, uh, so have your character do something to save the day for someone else right off the bat. And it doesn't have to be cheesy or obvious about it. It could be as simple as dropping a plate of treats off for a sad neighbor or, and then said in passing just like that. Or another example on her way out of the store, she dropped a dollar bill in Santa's cup, just basically showing they have a heart or that they care about someone else that they're willing to save the cat in some way can go really far. Um, there are many, many ways to save the cat. Uh, and I mentioned house already, but I, I freaking love the TV show house. It's, I'm not a huge TV person. And that's one that I'm just like, anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, in house, the uh, house saves the cat literally by saving patients. He's an arrogant jerk. He's intelligent, funny, and almost always right. Many of these character traits alone would be very annoying and would definitely rub people wrong, but they work when they, they are combined in that specific way for him. He doesn't have a lot of redeeming characteristics, but he does save patients' lives. Um, and I was going to play devil's advocate with Lindsay's first tip. You know, she said to create a character first, then plot. Um, I was going to say that I create plot first, but that's not entirely true. I had to actually think about that and go, when was last time I created a plot first? It's been a long time. What I usually do is I create the plot and the character roughly at the same time. Um, a lot of my most recent series have been based on characters that we met in a previous series. And so, duh, I know the characters before I even give them conflict and plot. Um, so the conflict in the plot, it generally excites me the most at the start, but what keeps me writing is how my characters react and grow around and from that conflict. So my tip is, is to create a conflict or plot you don't know how you'd deal with and see what your characters do, um, like blackmail or falling in love with the person you, you know, already know and absolutely hate. Um, things like that, just random things, um, and then exploring it and how you would respond and then see how it differs from how your characters would respond um, and then remember that people in, in real life rarely get over weaknesses completely. If somebody's struggling with being an arrogant jerk, they're probably going to struggle with that for nearly most of their life. Um, it's okay if your characters aren't perfect by the end of the book or series, but on the flip side, don't forget readers promises. Um, if you bring up the fact that say Nicole can't do magic in book one by the last book of the series, she darn well better be doing magic. So some weaknesses your characters are never going to get over and that's totally okay. Some they, they can totally overcome. Um, and don't make your characters true to life so much where they feel schizophrenic. I don't know if you guys have ever read books like this, but uh, books aren't nearly deep or complex enough to show every single aspect of a, of a character's personality the way you would know a dear friend or family member. Um, if you give people too much personality, you run the risk of having them feel mentally ill. Uh, because you can't, you just can't delve into every single faucet of a person's personality in a book unless you're writing really, really deep fiction that I don't have the capability emotional. I don't have the emotional wherewithal right now to write those kinds of books. Anyway, that's pretty much it from me.
Yeah, that was a good point about not necessarily, they don't have to get over their flaws or weaknesses. Like it is possible, depending on the flaw you give them, it may be something that you want them to gradually work toward and they can resolve by the end. But if you gave them something, uh, I'm, I'm going to use medical stuff later on because that's something I often do as someone with medical issues and with lots of friends with medical issues. Um, like I've actually had this conversation a number of times with an autistic uh, beta reader hate they hate and she's like really tied in the community she's like we hate it when autism is magically cured in by the science fiction or the magic so realize that if you're going to come up with a cure for something you actually may alienate readers and take away the thing that they really were identifying with that character for so it may be like they can still grow and change they may be just come they change in a way that they by the end of the series have come to accept things a little more like maybe if they were like really bitter about something especially if it's like a new diagnosis or something uh, at the beginning so yeah you don't have to fix everything by the end of the series uh most most flaws that we all have we're probably stuck with them for life all right and that on that note on that cheerful note let's get into the listener questions first one is from oh wait joe's gonna read the first one it's in red ink i knew that all right. Uh, yeah. First question is from Dominic. And the question is, can readers ever root for a writer protagonist? All right. I stuck myself in here first. Um, you know, I would never say never. There's like, there's, especially if you're indie publishing, there's no rules, hard set rules. If you want to try something, uh, you know, that's up to you. <laughs> if it doesn't sell, then you know it didn't work. Um, but I do think there's probably reasons why agents and publishers are like, never send us stories where it's a writer protagonist. And, it, you know, just they probably they've seen it a lot. And I would say to you, like, we, that tends to be the everyday man character, right? You're doing a very mundane job, possibly it would be considered by some. So if you are going to do the writer character, and you know, some genres may be more tolerant of this, like I think it's a writer, a scribe in a fantasy, epic fantasy, you probably want to give them some other skills too, you know, but maybe give them a couple hobbies. You know, he's also a black belt in Taekwondo, you know, something that's going to allow them to have uh, thrive in the story and have a couple other things that they can rely on because there's almost never going to be an opportunity where you can save the day by writing a book although i did do this in my star kingdom series spoilers the main character on the side is a has a pen name and writes novels and uh her writing the story of the characters that they the last eight books and putting it publishing it was help kind of helps them uh not get arrested and you know, executed and stuff in the end. They like, she, she's the reason they get turned into heroes. So, but it's very tough. And I feel like you can't do that very often. Like where a writer writes the book that, that solves the main conflict of the story. All right, you guys go on to you. All right. Um, I, I don't see why you can't necessarily write a, a writer protagonist. Murder She Wrote was popular and that's a writer protagonist. To be fair, she's not writing books as the thing that you're interested in. She's a writer who is doing interesting things instead of writing books, which goes along with what Lindsay was saying. Uh, it can be a little difficult and kind of navel, navel gazing e if you write a story that was about a writer whose only struggle was writing a story, since you'll ideally want to write obstacles that the average reader can understand and sympathize with. But otherwise, yeah, there's nothing specific about being a writer that makes a character unlikable or uninteresting. And um, yeah, um, I like that Lindsay and I are both like, no, don't do it. And Jill's like, do it. That's, it's totally fine. I have actually read um, at least two books that were about writers that I loved. Um, I personally don't enjoy most books written about writers, mainly because most of the time I'm reading them, I'm thinking about the author too much. So, and this was the case before I even started writing. I've only been writing since like 2008, 2007, something like that. Um, and so it kind of makes me uncomfortable. It's like, am I reading an autobiography? Are the struggles of this character the struggles of the author? And I just, I'm like, I'm, I'm wondering, I must not be very em empathetic because um, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't want to know what the author's struggling with. Um, when I'm reading fiction, I want to be reading fiction. But like I said earlier, there have been, um, there have been at least two, I can't remember their titles right now, which really sucks. But I've read at least two books um, about writers that I really enjoyed that were fictional and fun. Um, so if you find an original way for the, their writing to impact their life, it could be interesting. Um, but not knowing what to write or dealing with writer's block, those are things that pretty much every book about writers I've read has dealt with. So I would say avoid those sites, those sorts of conflicts. 
and I have the next question. <laughs> so Stephen says, what is your view on protagonists who are their own obstacle as in a story that doesn't really have a villain, but instead the, pro the protagonist has to overcome themselves. For example, the catcher in the rye. All right, uh, to a degree, I think the art of creating a good hero is doing this, at least partially, uh, even when there is a villain. Like being your own worst enemy is probably the thing that most readers will have the easiest time identifying with. Uh, though when you hit that close to home, you're probably going to want to limit your audience. You're, you're probably going to limit your audience a little t uh, because as readers are probably going to get inside the character's head more and more when they're mostly grappling with themselves. You have to make the, you, they'll get so deep into a, a, the character potentially that the hero will make a decision that they wouldn't make and then they'll just be pulled out of the story. So when you get really very psychological with a character, you have to be very clear with uh, the motivations. Like if there's going to be a plot swerve or a uh, decision that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense to the average person, you have to make sure that you lay the groundwork and foreshadow it. But uh, yeah, I think it's excellent to have internal struggles be the driver of a story. Um, and this is an answer I give quite regularly. I'm going to say it probably depends on the genre. Um, some genres need antagonists. Uh, readers expect them and might feel let down if there isn't one. I think it depends on how you handle it, though. Um, I've never read a fantasy where there wasn't somebody who played an antag antagonistical, antagonistic <laughs> role. Um, even one where the main character was his own worst enemy too. Uh, but there are a lot of genres where a villain doesn't need to exist. So like romance, dramas, et cetera, they don't necessarily need antagonists. And depending on how you handle the, um, uh, depending on how you handle things, you could, I mean, other genres probably could be done very well with that too. And I'm going to say absolutely. The, the types of conflict, if you look up the list, are like man versus self, man versus man, man versus society, man versus nature. And some of them add in man versus fate and man versus machine. Man versus self is always like the first one listed. So yes, and I, I've seen it in all, I would say all genres. It tends to be more, I want to say like literary or in short stories and that kind of thing for the man versus self kind of thing, or, you know. But man versus nature is huge in sci-fi. Uh, that's, <laughs> boy, <laughs> nature is tough in space. Um, but I, and I would say a lot of mine are very much, there are antagonists. I write basically action adventure stories. Um, but like a very common theme is that the hero in trying to do the right thing finds himself at odds with like the government ruling regime and like, if he would just do what, <laughs> you know, what he's told, what the law says, um, you know, he would be okay. But in choosing not to do that, or she, I've done them both ways, you know, they basically get themselves into a lot of trouble. But because it's fiction, uh, they are doing the right thing, or the reader and the author believe so. And, and by the end, often you end up with the government overthrown. I wonder if we're a period of our own times. I have no idea, no comment on that. The lovely thing though about writing sci-fi is you're like, no, it's the star kingdom. It's, it's nothing on earth. It would, it would not be at all thinking about anything going on on earth. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a very common theme, at least for me, is that they make things worse on themselves by being who they are and, and trying to do what they think is the right thing. And I feel like a lot of us often feel that way and we don't get to act. We just, most of us are just like, we got to do the best we can in the world we're in. So it's fun to hear, fun to read about heroes that actually do change the world. Um, maybe, you know, if you're writing contemporary romance, probably that is not <laughs> going to be the theme of uh, fantasy and sci-fi. You're always overthrowing the evil overlord, right? But um, even then, uh, often the conflicts may be a little smaller, like they're trying to change the PTA board at school or something, you know, but yeah, there's, it's very often the case. And I think that just be careful, I would say, because you can go too far, the reader can get sick of them always getting themselves in trouble. So realize that they have to win at some point or, uh, and the reader has to like want them to win. So just be careful with that kind of thing. All right, next question is from Casey. I'd like to see some commentary about ensemble slash multi POV juggling, of making your protagonist more enticing. I tend to do ensembles a lot and I just love having different attitudes and pers perspectives. And I know that people won't jive with every single one, but they all bring something to the story. And my answer for this is I'm going to hand off answering to Lindsay and Joe, since they both have a lot more experience with ensemble cast than I do. 
All right, I do ensemble casts a lot. And when we were talking earlier about sometimes your, uh, your protagonist can feel wooden if the plot is written first, this can also happen if the ensemble cast uh, is what you've chosen because the protagonist is the one who is driving the plot most of the time. And therefore the ensemble gets to have a lot more fun because they can do whatever they want. Uh, so that's one thing, but that's not what you asked about. Um, uh, one of the things I like to do with ensembles is pair them off. Uh, you know, aside from giving you a separate plot thread that allows you to keep things fresh and moving, uh, it lets personalities clash and then gel, and then uh, it makes for good dialogue. Like arguments are great and banter is great and two characters don't get along that are stuck together is a fantastic thing to do. Every sitcom's done it for a good reason. Um, but also those things, you know, you, as they get more accustomed to each other, the dynamic changes, that's interesting. And then you can break those groups up and split them up differently. And now you've got whole new personalities bouncing off each other and by doing that you're especially if you put opposing personalities together every thread is going to have one you know if they're the, if they're appreciably different then that thread is going to have if you don't like person a you're probably gonna like person b because of how different they are so you can usually keep reader interest by having characters who are different enough paired up uh, and i'm not even talking about romance the like partnering up just working together is enough to add narrative punch and and uh I guess the advice would be to not focus too much on making the characters enticing, but focus on making the interactions enticing because those are those are it, it always going to be more flavorful once you start combining them. Uh, yes, I'm a fan of ensemble cast too. Uh, even though everything gets much more complicated and the books get longer when <laughs> when you have all these characters, so I think the key to making all of the POVs interesting is to basically every character that is a POV should believe that they are the protagonist of the story with their own defined goals and motivations. You know, you'll probably find that one character, the series or whatever, ends up revolving more around them and they are kind of the main protagonist. But these other people are all trying to accomplish things too. They're not just there on the ship because they're getting paid, right? They're, they have reasons, they should have things that they're trying to do. And, and that's going to make them more interesting and it makes us want them to see them succeed, even if they're just doing some side thing. You know, I've talked about before the, the security guard I had that wanted to start his empire of barbecue sauces and he was always grilling something new at every planet they went to. And that was his goal. And by the end, he leaves the ship and he's become a multimillionaire off of his barbecue sauces. So there you go. Um, and, and kind of what Joe was saying too, uh, conflict, can, you can have external conflict. But uh, with these kind of casts, especially if you're like on a spaceship or something in sci-fi where they're really stuck together and butting heads a lot, um, the internal conflict can also be very interesting. And I think one of the mistakes authors sometimes make is trying to make every member of the character, every member of the cast likable. But you'll find things that are a little more interesting if someone is kind of a jerk. Um, I always think of Firefly as an example of this. Jane, who was basically trying to turn in for the bounty, the other character, you know, the doctor and his sister for the first half of the series, or it was such a short short-lived series, the first half of season one anyway. So that made it interesting. You never knew if he was going to turn on the captain or if he was going to turn on the other characters. And you kind of liked him anyway as a character because he got all the good lines and he got to name is gun so uh, just realize that when you do have a big cast like that you can have characters that aren't super likable i wouldn't make the unlikable characters povs or large povs if you don't feel that you can make them likable by writing them um, but if they're just kind of they're there they're along for the ride they don't have to be your guys they can turn in the good guy makes it interesting gives it a little more conflict it tends to be really boring if everybody in the adventuring party just gets along and they all think the hero is great, not only boring, but it can be a little annoying when everybody likes the heroine or the hero. It's usually the heroine. For some reason, the female character is like, ah, we all love her. She's really annoying to the reader, but we all love her. It's great. So you don't have to have everybody uh, get along together. And it's probably better if they don't. And that gives their relationships a chance to evolve, as Joe was saying, you know, over the course of the series. All right, passing it back to you, Joe. All right, this question is from Letty. How do you make each of your protagonists have a distinct voice so they feel like different people to the reader, whether it is in a multi POV book or in the next book? So a couple things. First, and this is a dirty little secret, you don't always have to do this. Depends on how different your books are. Uh, obviously in the same book, you want variety amongst the characters, 
uh, and if it's different books in the same series, you want variety amongst the characters. But if you're branching into an incredibly different genre, like I have written in sci-fi, I've written in fantasy, I've written in steampunk, you can pretty much take the same basic skeleton of a character and they will be drastically different in that different story because the circumstances surrounding them are different. I mean, you're obviously going to want to give them different names and, and differentiate them a little bit, but you can make them almost exactly identical. And, you know, a, a fiercely analytical detail based person in a medieval fantasy is going to be almost useless on a battlefield. Uh, they'd be better planning, but uh, that same person in a sci fi setting would be the leader of a company or an admiral. Like, you can just take precisely the same personality and change the circumstances and have them feel like an entirely different person because of how they've had to deal with things. But to not dodge your question, diversity is a good place to start. To have a good mix of races, genders, philosophies uh, that's going to automatically differentiate uh, as long as you represent them, you know, in a way that is believable. Uh, a cheap way to do this, uh, especially if you have characters that by, for whatever reason, sort of need to be somewhat similar, is to give uh, one or two of them distinct speech patterns. Uh, again, you don't want to like give somebody phonetic cockney speech because uh, it'll get really exhausting to read. But, you know, a couple of turns of phrase and mannerisms, uh, you know, make, make them noticeably Southern or, you know, just throw stuff like that in, it will be, again, sort of a dialogue shorthand that will allow you to differentiate. Plus, and this is weird that I've found, when you give somebody a certain manner of speech, you start writing them in a different way. Uh, you just start to, you know, because you sort of have to put together the thoughts that produce that dialogue. Uh, and so it's that's just another small but easy thing to do. Having two people working together who are subtly or drastically different in their motivations is a great way to create tension. So just motivations in general, giving people different goals is a good way to differentiate them. And uh, yeah, I mean, put a mixture of those things together. And I think you'll have a hard time making characters that are substantially the same, let alone having a hard time differentiating them. And I agree with Joe on this one, um, his first point, simply tossing the same personality into a completely different setting, a different conflict, bad guy story, et cetera, would bring out hugely different results. Um, that said, thought process is where I distinguish between my characters. So Lizzie is upbeat, Nicole is thoughtful and analytical, and these are my different main characters of my series. Abel is abrupt, Jacob is earnest, Carter's anxious and honest, Ridge is rash and doesn't think decisions through. Um, basically, they all have at least one characteristic that makes them stand out, and there are a ton of adject seriously, there's tons of adjectives in the dictionary to pick from. So one thing you can do is write down character traits, so a one-word character trait or a phrase for a character trait on slips of paper, fold them up, put them in a jar, then remove two or three random ones anytime you need to create a new character and see what happens. And that's kind of something that you do once you get to the point you're like, okay, what's this next character going to be about? You know, because you've written all the all the characters in the whole world and need more ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that I have written a series now in books that I, I would definitely say that I struggle with like coming up with new types of characters. I tend to have my three or four types that I like to write and I gravitate towards. And the farther I get away from it, like I can make a different type of character, but I'm not as interested in them. You know, especially like if you've got a romance or something, you probably have like the same types of guys and everyone is like, you're a dream guy, possibly. Um, but so yeah, it is actually a challenge I would say probably not with your first series, um, but as you keep writing and you have readers go, you know, they kind of all have the same sense of humor. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of my sense of humor. I mean, what are you gonna do, right? Um, but I, I said this before and I find it really helpful and I'm, I'm probably gonna do it more going onward because it's been so helpful for me is um, like I said, modeling them off of real people or actors that are super distinct in your mind and have a lot of personality. Um, like I said, I don't always do this, but when I've done it, I've usually adored or hated the character, you know, had strong feelings about them the same way as I adore or hate the uh, person that I modeled them after. And it's, you know, it's rarely somebody I actually know. Um, that might make it a little awkward if you're like, dude, this is my husband <laughs> modeling this after you think he'll notice. Um, so it's, so I don't really know them well. I'm just kind of grabbing sort of their personality a little bit and some of their traits and um I don't know, I find it really helpful for me. And by the time you add, like I said, you put them in your world with their goals and uh, add a couple of your own flaws. They do, I think by the time you start writing, they do become unique people and nobody's gonna be like, oh, obviously this is, um, you know, this person from the new the Channel 5 news anchor or whatever, you know? So I, I just find that super useful because real people are quite interesting. 
which is always weird to me when characters are boring. I'm like, most people are not this boring. <laughs> I do know some, but uh, you know, I, I find that uh, real people are quite interesting. Whether I like them, love them or hate them, uh, the ones that you have the strongest feelings about might be really good uh, people to model characters after. Uh, okay, Andrea, passing it back to you. Uh, one of my auth- um, she's an author friend I had, we, uh, let's see, how long ago was it? Uh, before I started indie publishing. So it was back when I was with a publisher. She she wrote a romance and based the main guy after an ex-boyfriend. And she gave him the same name as her ex-boyfriend. And he found the book. <laughs> she wasn't a well-known author. And he lived in a totally different state, had no idea she was a writer anymore. He found the book and emailed her and it was like, uh, did you mean to do this? She's like, I gave him, I changed his name. And she's like, oh, the name I changed it to was his real name. Anyway, (laughs) so if you do model it after somebody, you know, change the name. (laughs) I I still get the giggles over that. Uh, Great. Okay. The next question is from Alexa, not Alexa, Alexa from Google or, you know, Hey Google and, and Siri and all that stuff. But Alexa says, any hints on how not to write unlikable heroes? I write romance and constantly have to go back over the second and third drafts to add in redeeming characteristics. All right. So this is a tricky path. Um, You will uh, presumably they're unlikable for a reason or they have unlikable behavior. Uh, You're going to want to make sure that there is a reason. Uh, Uncovering it, uncovering that reason probably is going to be the focus of your story. But if it isn't, uh, make sure you do. Uh, You don't have to do it immediately, but you should hint at it pretty early on or else people might not feel compelled to stick around. Uh, You'll also need to learn which lines of unlikability you absolutely cannot cross. There are different points of no return for different uh, readers. Uh, A kick the dog moment can make a hero completely unredeemable. We mentioned save the cat, kick the dog as its opposite. And uh, this varies not just with in world the in world social values, but with the actual philosophies of the reader. So, like some people are going to say, "Oh, well, he was unfaithful," but they'll just let that go. Uh, other people will absolutely never like a character who was unfaithful. So, you need to know your audience as well as you know establish the uh, the rules of the world to make them sort of mesh in order for that character to still be a viable uh, a centerpiece for the story. All right. Well, I feel like I probably usually don't make unlikable heroes, but um, I do see that being very common in romance because you have to have conflict between the heroine and the hero starting out for them to overcome and resolve. Otherwise, it's like, eh, they're just going to get together. And it's like that. So I feel like you often start uh, start off in an antagonistic relationship. Um, I When I do romance in my fantasy and sci-fi, I really like to make it more like the conflict is because there's like from different cultures are, that are at war. I like to have it more of a which side of the train tracks you're from kind of thing than actually making the uh, the male hero, I mean, it could be the female <laughs> hero into making them dislikable. I'd rather make them cool, but it just, you know, it's not gonna work. We're, <laughs> you know, you're from the rich family, I'm from the poor family, uh, that kind of thing. So that's one way to avoid uh, that kind of conflict that might make the, you know, because I pick up a lot of books. I'm like, no, I'm not reading about this guy. He's a jerk. I don't like him. So I just won't read on. So that's uh, that is a real uh, legitimate fear. But I to answer your question more uh, aptly, thoroughly, something like that, the short answer is to kind of let the know, let the reader know as early as is possible, like Joe was saying, uh, what their motivations are and why they are the way they are. Um, and I will give an example where I did have a super unlikable guy uh, that became the romantic lead in his own book. And it was never planned that way. He was basically the foil for my hero, who was this pilot, general, adored by all the ladies. Everybody loved him. So this guy had a reason to, like, who wouldn't hate somebody like that, right? Um, so he was m- meant to die. And like early on in the series, he was just there to be like a red shirt and to be in the way of the hero. But he, they had such good, uh, almost a bromance, I guess you could call it. They hated each other, but they had such good uh, banter with each other. I was like, oh, I get to keep this guy around. And then my beta readers were like, yeah, we're kind of getting into this guy. You should give him his own romance novel as, as a side book. And I was like, you know, no, no woman is going to want this guy. <laughs> so it was like a challenge for me to get inside his head and 
make him a likable enough character. And and like I said, I never really, I never tried to make it like he's got a heart of gold inside because that can, that's kind of BS. Like people are going to go, no way, <laughs> you know, not based on his past actions. But what I did is just kind of go back to his childhood a little bit and figure out why he is so the way he is. So, and I think uh, we actually like that, especially women. We like the guys that are like rough on the outside, or we think we do in the romance novels anyway. Real life, you should probably marry the nice guy. Um, but you know, so that's the thing that is appealing to like have the rough and tough. He's, he seems like a jerk to everyone. And then you get the one that's kind of like, well, let's dig a little deeper. And maybe he's got redeeming uh, features. So just give a hint of that redeeming stuff and let it come out by the end of the story. And I, I think that is a way to make a character that seems really abrasive uh, more likable. Okay, Andrea, take it over. Um, so I've had this problem in the past, um, accidentally writing uh, people who are unlikable. And I found it took conscious effort while writing to make them likable. I have a 10 book series where the first, the main character was unlikable in that first book. And I think I talked about this last time we talked about craft. Um, and so just a conscious effort while writing and then lots of analyzing over the thoughts and actions that, and the comments that my character was making. And um, I'm naturally sarcastic and blunt. So if I let too much of my personality enter my books, my characters come across as sarcastic and blunt. And apparently that's repulsive <laughs> to some readers. Uh, but it is honestly like sarcasm is something that not a lot of people will catch. And so you can have a character who is sarcastic, but they need to also be uh, you got to soften it a little bit from possibly the way you would have them the way they would be in real life or have them be not a main character so like a sarcastic side character is fine but your main character just tread carefully and then I, I my I don't know my advice is just I just analyze and I'm and I'm sorry but it might just take 20 novels before it it becomes something that's not so much of something you have to work on sarcasm is definitely a tough one to convey only in the written word without like the the wink and the smile ah, i'm just joking i i, just, I kind of had and it's probably obvious to everyone it was kind of an epiphany to me like why i really disliked people online uh that were sarcastic to me even though i knew them in real life and like i know this person is pretty cool in real life and the whole sarcasm thing it's like if you make it towards other characters or to your protagonist or whoever the reader is rooting for or if you're just doing this as a person, if your jokes put down other people, it's mean, it's cruel, it's going to be seen that way. You can still do humor and sarcasm and make it like self-deprecating humor or make it about the situation rather than a diss, <laughs> I'm going to say a diss, a slur or something towards the other characters. Because it's just like if the situation you're being sarcastic about that, that's just nobody, that's funny. Nobody, you know, you're not hurting anybody's feelings. If they're always mean to a character, it's going to come across as like, I don't like that protagonist or that person. They're always mean, they're, they're rude. So um I, I try to remember that myself because I also have the sarcastic streak and I try to edit before the words come out of the mouth, but oh my gosh, it's hard when you're talking. It's much easier to be like clever on the page than it is in real life. All right, next question is from Dale. I have an, un yeah, I have an ensemble cast series. The male hero keeps getting himself in trouble and the female members keep rescuing him. Problem or pro? <laughs> Um, all right, so I think this is overall, this is fine, as long as it's not, like, repetitive. Uh, it just sounds like a character trait. Uh, I will say that you need to make sure that character who keeps on getting in trouble has a reason to be in the story other than that. Otherwise, it's just going to be incredibly annoying if their entire role in the story is to be an obstacle. So, you know, make them either really charming or, you know, fairly capable except for you know tripping up or make them logistically indispensable because that that situation where like well you know we don't like him but he's in charge you know like as long as the person has a, a reason that they would still be part of the team when this is happening uh then i think you can get away with it but again don't be repetitive and i would say um I personally would vary it up a bit. Um, being predictable can cause readers to stop reading and it also might re lead readers to wonder why he's incapable of rescuing himself occasionally. Um, that, those are just my initial thoughts and my last thoughts and my middle thoughts. <laughs> so many thoughts. Um, so my reaction is kind of like, this sounds like the kind of thing that may annoy your male readers and get you reviews about it being like too politically correct or too woke. Like the guy is always being rescued by the women. Um, 
can they save each other 50 50 like i don't know why i remember this but i remember as a kid watching the original reruns of the original star trek and i kept track like how often did spock save kirk and how often did kirk save spock and i just like that they kind of it wasn't always like spock wasn't always the perfect one sometimes captain kirk saved him uh you know so i i feel like we like equality <laughs> we like fairness as a species we rarely see it in the real world so it's a really appealing when uh we kind of get it like sometimes he's the hero sometimes she's the hero because um i think you know yay it's not the female that's the damsel in distress but i i think you probably don't necessarily want to do a male damsel in distress either if it is your one of your main protagonists um uh, we, we like people to be able to get themselves out of situations <laughs> sometimes and be able to save the day. Um, yeah, and it's satisfying when um, somebody who was the damsel in distress grows and becomes the hero, you know, blah, blah, blah. I had thoughts for uh, the ones that Andrea didn't fill in, so, but I will now pass it to Joe for the next question. Okie doke. Brent asks, how do you write a great anti-hero? And uh, I think the trick is not making them immoral, but making their personal morals differ, differ from the morals of the world around them. So they might lie, cheat, and steal, but they don't lie to the people who don't deserve to be lied to, and they don't steal from people who can't afford it, for example. Um, they need to have a personal code, even if they don't realize it. And th that, that's often a really good scene with an anti-hero is when they come up against the situation that they've done many, many, many times, but they can't bring themselves to do it this time because they realize that the person that they would be doing it to just doesn't deserve it uh, or wouldn't be able to handle it. So they're following rules. They're just not following the rules. And also, as I said earlier, no kicking dogs. There's going to be a moral event horizon that uh, once you cross it, they're not an anti-hero. They're a villain or a fallen hero. I like that Joe was like, lie with you always, cheat death and steal your heart. That's why I, what I thought he was going towards there, <laughs> the lie, cheat, still. Um, my advice here is to study stories um, with great antiheroes. So like Google it, pick a, a favorite movie or two, watch those movies a few times, analyze what makes the antiheroes so awesome and do the same with books and then just apply what you learn. Um, I've never written an antihero story. So that's basically what I would do myself if I were writing one. I would just, I would research and study what's already been done and what's been done well. Yeah, I feel like I'm not drawn to these types of characters myself, so I can't think of a whole lot that I've read that truly fall into this camp. I can think of heroes where like their demonic sword required souls in order for him to live, so he had to kill people, but it wasn't really his fault because there was a demonic sword and, you know, it, this is kind of a blurry line. Um, I have done a couple characters that were kind of the love interests and not necessarily the POV characters that would probably fall into the anti-hero camp. And I think it's a little easier to get away with stuff when they're not the main character. Um, but I, I think it's, again, it's showing that they have like a code or they are doing things for a reason. If they're vigilant, vigilante, um, they're, you know, they're not going to obey the law. They're completely uh, against the law, but they're also trying to catch the bad guy or bring justice about something like that. Cause there's a lot of, um, I'm going to avoid making political statements, but I'm like, I can think of some heroes out there that some people hate and some people love. And it's like, if you love the thing that they're doing, cause you also agree like, man, yeah, the laws are not quite right. Then maybe you'll really connect with that kind of character. So I, you know, I guess the thing would be to like really make it clear that there's a reason for doing the things he's doing or she's doing um, as early on as you can. Like you don't want to necessarily, you want some mystery. You don't want to give everything on page one and have the whole backstory and for it to be boring. But you also have to give enough that we want to find out why they are the way they are. And like I said, it's easier to do that when they're not the main character, when they're like the love interest or something. And you got seven books before they're gonna hook up. And over the course of seven books, a little bit comes out here and there. There's a reason why they're like killing all these guys and they're against the king and all that. Um, so it, it's a challenge. I, I'd probably not do it for your first book to be quite honest or your first series. Um, I would kind of kind of wait until you're experienced as a writer and, and you think that you have an audience that likes that kind of character. All right, go ahead, uh, Andrea. I think we got a couple more questions or lots more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I, hold on, I had dropped my document down. Okay, so Robert says, slightly off topic, I hope this adds to rather than distracts from the discussion, but is it is it even necessary to create protagonists that readers really want to root for? Can a great plot carry the story even if readers don't necessarily love or even like the protagonist? I say this because no one is universally loved by all and some readers won't like the protagonist no matter how you craft them. 
Um, all right, so you can create a really rich world and a fascinating plot, uh, but if you don't have at least one protagonist that people will at least tolerate, then you're basically putting a, a rock in the shoe of your readers. Like now there's something in the way of them enjoying the tapestry you've painted. Uh, you can also make a, a protagonist who the readers are hoping will get their comeuppance. Uh, but either way, you're writing on hard mode. Like a, a, there's a reason why most stories have got an interesting protagonist. Uh, and, and, you know, you should have a fantastic plot. And you want to know something? If you make your fantastic plot and you make your fantastic world, it will be better if you also have a good protagonist. So try to make sure that there is one. And um, I say, yes, it's possible. Um, a lot of readers don't like the main character in my Mosaic Chronicles. I think I mentioned, I think I mentioned this. I mentioned it this episode at least. Um, but because they love the plot, they stuck to the series. But that said, once I fixed her up, the series did so much better. So um, obviously you're just, I mean, aim, aim to do, have the best character possible, not meaning like the most perfect one, but one that people relate to because, and then just ignore people who aren't gonna like it. Um, yes. <laughs> what was the question? No. That's what I get for fiddling around with uh, Zoom or whatever we're on. So um, I think you can make a hero that the reader kind of hates. I talked about this before, hate reading. It's a thing where, you know, because I often like, I don't know, I often hate female protagonists. I don't know, for some reason I judge them more harshly than the male protagonists. I don't know. Maybe it's the other way around for guys. I have no idea. But I, I, for some reason, I don't click a lot of times. But it could just be me not really being the target audience for uh, a lot of <laughs> popular books out there. That's probably it. It's probably me. Um, but I think to the books that you, that most of us want to write are the kind of books that people will go back and read again and again. And these tend to have characters that we love spending time with, man. We wish we could like invite them over to the backyard barbecue on the weekend and they just all come hang out with us because they're really, they feel like family by the end of the story. It's kind of, it doesn't have to be the, your goal. Not everybody is writing that kind of story, but I think you get a lot of rereadability. I think you get a lot of readers trusting that you're going to create a cast of characters that they like, and they're going to go along on the journey with you when you start a new series. I think if they didn't love the characters, it becomes a little bit more of a question mark. You really have to be good at the plot. They have to trust that they're going to love the plot that uh, you're creating in the next book. But I feel like we look at the blurb and you're like, ah, that plot's not really my thing as much. But um, if you know the characters are going to be awesome, you're going to sign on for it anyway. Uh, also, just to um, go on your comment about no one's universally loved by all. Absolutely. Um, some of my protagonists that I love, other characters in the books hate, which is intentional because nobody loves everybody, right? There's a, certain types are always going to rub you the wrong way. But what's important is that your target audience is into them. So you'll kind of know... You know, and your target audience probably likes a lot of the same things that you like, but make sure you love the character and hope there are enough people out there like you. That is the great thing about like self-publishing is you can find 10,000 people out there, which is really a small number by traditional publishing standards. But if you find five or 10,000 people like you that love what you write, you can make a whole career about that way by, you know, if you're able to publish a couple books a year and those people always buy them. Um, so it just has to be your target audience is into the characters. All right, we're just gonna do one more question tonight and then I think we're gonna save uh, a couple more and we'll answer them on a future episode. This last one is from Peter. How do you come up with credible flaws for your protagonists that impede them on their journey without sounding cliche and overused? All right, I'm gonna start by saying that cliches are overused for a reason and it's because they work. Uh, as long as you do something well, it doesn't really matter if it's been done before. But that said, making a flaw highly related to the setting is an excellent way to make it, you know, unique to your book. Uh, if someone is an outcast who is distrusted by society, which is a pretty common trope and you could call it cliche, it will become unique in your book because your society is unique and therefore the reason would be unique. Uh, similarly, making flaws and obstacles that are very specific to the characters is going to help. So if friction exists specifically because of who your character is in relation to another character, the whole characterization of both characters becomes part of the flaw and therefore it is by definition deeper. So the way you avoid cliches is by making them specific to your, to your setting. Yeah. Um... 
kind of going along with what Joe said, um, cliche, the, the phrase cliched writing is a term I heard all the time um, back when I was in the traditional publishing world. And it took me several years, several years as an independent author to get it out of my system because I mean, it's so, I know agents are like, don't turn in a manuscript that has something in it that's ever been done before. Don't do, don't do elves. Don't do, you know, any of that. And so I based my whole first series trying to make it I based my series off that advice and try to make it as original as possible and as uncliched as possible. And of course, as a new writer, I was like, there's lots of cliches in it. Um, but honestly, readers and cliches, like Joe said, exist for a reason. Uh, they're usually regularly, honestly called tropes, though cliches obviously are slightly different. But if you write to trope, you're writing what readers expect and your books will do better. Um, that said, you don't need to write what readers expect all the time. You can take a setting and conflict creatures, et cetera, that readers expect and put in a character they don't. Um, so for just a quick example, my Coven Chronicles follows urban fantasy tropes, but my main character is bouncy and cheerful. And most urban fantasy characters are serious and determined. And so is the tone of the book. Uh, but that series is still done, has still done very well. And I mean, I just say, don't stress so much about being cliched unless you're writing flat. There's a difference between tropes and cliches and flat like write something that's exciting to you and fun for you and that goes through that will um, go through in your writing so the readers are also enjoying it so i would just say this is kind of not quite <laughs> what you asked but as far as stuff being overused uh as far as flaws that are kind of turnoffs and some of the stuff we feel is cliche and overused is because we've seen it a lot. And not only that, but we don't really like it. Like if we see something a lot and we love that thing, we don't call it a cliche. We're like, dude, I love that. That's my favorite thing when they have to deal with that. So I would ask more like, how can I avoid flaws that annoy people? Um, and basically avoid giving your character flaws that people hate in other people, that you hate in other people. Because man, we are judgy. We don't care. <laughs> we, we are a judgy society. Um, so, but you can, you know, because like I've seen drinking problems a lot in like PI, <laughs> PI stuff, short tempers, the, char the, hero, the hero that cannot keep his temper. I see like every other romance novel, it seems like has that one. Or especially, you know, I think there's more variety now, but I, I just remember going through a streak where I'm like, really, that's his flaw, short temper again. <laughs> so just be creative and pick things that are you know like the kryptonite but not necessarily like maybe it's not the reader or the character's fault um like i said i have health issues and i have a lot of friends that have health issues so i do that a lot and you don't see that a whole lot in sci-fi and fantasy so it's it kind of adds an originality element but um you know i've done like a type 1 diabetic i've done asthmatics i've done people with autism i've done the seizure prone character and these are all things that they come. They can come into play in the plot and how characters interact with them. And they, if they have a seizure during the story, that's not, you know, it was even used against my character. And I, you know, I've done these things because I, like I said, it's either one of my things or I know people well, like one of my beta readers has seizures. So I, I can be like, hey, did I kind of get this right? You know, is this a thing that would actually trigger one? And and she's like, you know, yeah, you got it right. Or no, you know, maybe change that up a little bit. And so... But these kind of problems are, you know, they're interesting and they're things that we tend not to see a lot, like I said, especially in sci-fi and fantasy. And so they're not going to feel as cliche and they are things that probably if you do it right, if you have health issues, it's probably going to come into play. If you go into space, <laughs> like my seizure character had stuff controlled and under the medication was working and then he's in space and like, you're going to find out really quick if you have issues, if they, they send you to space. But um. And you'll find too that you get readers that email you and be like, oh my gosh, me too. I have that. Thank you so much for doing a character like that. You know, and I don't think you're ever going to get that if you did a character who loses his temper all the time, even though we all have that. <laughs> it's like, we don't, since we consider it like we hate that we lost our temper. You know, it's not like something we even want to identify with, but um, so just, I guess, be creative, you know, don't go for the first thing just because you've seen it done a lot in your, in your genre. Um, think about things. And obviously it doesn't have to be health stuff. It may be like whatever your thing is that you're dealing with, or you have a lot of experience with um, that can be your thing. Um, just kind of avoid the stuff that that we find dislikable and then we're like come on you should have just dealt with that even if it's not fair like I said people are judgy on that stuff and uh it's gonna be harder to overcome than something that uh is not necessarily the character's fault <laughs> um all right do you guys have any final thoughts I think we're gonna wrap it up there we have been talking oh my gosh over an hour again how do we do this guys
Um, I, I, I'd say I've got my uh, my point across so far. So looking forward to finishing up these in, in a future episode. I have a serious case of dry mouth. So <laughs> like I'm stumbling over my answers now. <laughs> I finished my beverage. So I guess I know that where I have to go next. All right. I'm sorry for being the long, long-winded one. All right. So we will answer the last couple next time. And for this time, thank you for listening, everyone. And thank you to Joshua Pearson for producing the show. Uh, you can find the show notes or leave a comment or question at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six, or leave a comment or question in the Facebook group, Six Figure Authors, which is where most people do. Every now and then we get a comment on the page. I'm like, ooh, a comment. <laughs> but um, thank you, everyone, and have a great week. Bye-bye. Talk to you all later. So long, everybody.